Hi everyone, uh, my name is Billy Carlson. I am here with another design process interview with my friend Ben Inchek from Fuzzy Math. Ben, please say hello. Hello. How's it going? So uh, Ben is here today and uh, he's going to talk to us about the difference between designing maybe more of a content heavy website and an application and all that goes into that. So Ben, please introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Ben Inchek. I'm a co-founder at Fuzzy Math. We're a user experience design strategy and innovation firm based out of Chicago. We have about 20 designers on staff. We've been around for a little over 10 years. Uh, my background is when I was in high school, way back when in the late 90s, I was part of a startup and we sold things that we liked doing. So we sold skateboards and paintball guns and music. Um, that was a dot-com boom. So there was, you know, it was brand new. I did not know that you could work out of a basement and work on a computer and work with your friends for a living. And I got totally hooked. So I went to school for that specifically, got a, a degree in computer science and eventually a master's degree in human computer interaction, um, both from a DePaul University here in Chicago. HCI or human computer interaction is a fancy word for UX. I uh, really fell in love with it and uh, started at uh, working with the, the guys that started Fuzzy Math right out of grad school. And uh, 10 years later, here, here I am. That's really cool. Uh, Ben's firm is awesome. They do great work. And I've been fortunate to work with him and witness him in action. So that's why I wanted to have you here today. Um, I want to, let's just kick it off about talking, uh, discussing your design process. Yeah. Um, heavily influenced by, by DePaul and the, the process we learned there. Um, at the end of the day, it's user-centered design. We really put the human beings that are consuming information, that are using the application we're designing, are using the website that, you know, that we're designing, we put them at the center of the process. So we really want to learn about them, what their process is, what the current state is, where the, uh, you know, where are the pain points, what's missing, where are the areas that they're really getting confused and try to, try to smooth things out for them. Um, it's interesting because we're consultants, so we're, we're external parties to everybody that we work with. And, you know, the people, the people writing the checks to us aren't necessarily the people that we care about the most. We really want to talk to the end user and uh, what, what their current experience looks like and why, why is it not working for them. That's really interesting. That's probably a tough pitch meeting. We don't care <laughs> yeah. about you. But it is very true. Uh, that's what stakeholders sometimes need to hear to make a really good product. Um, yeah, so. yeah it's, uh, it's fun. And I, I think... You know, the, the process we use lets us just kind of shadow people and we do a whole lot of research. Ideally, um, every project starts with research and then we do research throughout the entire engagement. Um, up front, it's learning about what, what's there today. Sometimes it's an existing product. Sometimes the, the business has identified that something's missing and they just don't know what it is yet. Uh, so it's our job to do some research and figure out, um, you know, what what changes to make or what, what the new product should be, but it all starts with research and it's, you know, I'm naturally curious. I like asking yeah. questions. I like seeing how people work. I like trying to figure, figure out why they're doing things a certain way and, and how we can make it better. That's really cool. Um, I love it. And I was wondering, maybe you can dig in a little, little more about exactly maybe a few different research um, ways you do research in that beginning when you're sort of learning from people. Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, the the best in my opinion or my favorite, the, the most useful to me is contextual inquiry. So what uh, pretty much every project that's, that's a request. We want to sit next to people. Typically, you know, somebody would be sitting right about here and I would be using software in my day to day and I'm just going to observe them and say, you know, what, what are you doing? Can you speak out loud? Tell me what's going on. Typically, you hear things like, yeah, and then I log into this, and I do this 30 times a day, and I hate it, and I want to never log in again, and we're furiously taking notes. Yeah. Um, but it's something that, if you could do it in person, it's great, or you, I think you could only do it in person, but um, you learn so much outside of just what's going on on their screen. Uh, recently, we were working with a large insurance company. We were sitting in a service center, and some of the most valuable information we learned was... Uh, what was around their computer. So almost everybody had post-it notes, handwritten post-it notes with phone numbers, or if it's this procedure, do these things. And once you start asking somebody of like, 
I see a bunch of post-it notes. Can you explain what, what, what this is telling you? You learn that it's actually really hard to find the help section or there's no contact information within the software. And so it's um, contextual inquiry really is like, what's this holistic view of everything going on? And if you're curious enough and kind of just learn to take in as much as humanly possible, post-it notes, phone calls, what's going on around them, where are they sitting? Um, one of my favorite questions to ask is how, how do you get like financial incentives? Like, do you get a bonus? What's that based on? It's like, well, if I do X amount of these every day, I'm average. But if I do 10% more than that, I get a really nice bonus at the end of the year. So being able to talk to somebody and to watch a new software is a really powerful tool. That's really cool. Um, I love that. So um, let's just walk through the whole process because I think it's really interesting and I think people can learn a lot from it. Um, and the reason why is a lot of these videos, what we're trying to do with the education team at Balsamic is to create content for, for maybe PMs or non-designers like you know developers, a writer, um, think of anyone that is going to be helping make a digital product. So I think uh, these are great insights that they can even take and do on their own. Yeah, I will do my best. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so I think you're already doing a great job. So after contextual inquiry, which is also one of my favorite things to do, um, there's just so much learning there. So what is next after that? Yeah, and I'm looking around the room to see if I can show you anything. Um, <laughs> so uh, a great next step. So you do some research. So it could be contextual inquiry. It could be just pure stakeholder interviews or just an interview, just talking to somebody. You don't have to watch anything. Just talk to them. It could be a survey. Um, it could be a whole handful of things. But no matter what you do, the outcome of that we do here at Fuzzy Math is you get your thoughts out of your head. Typically some sticky notes. Typically the gist is what do we learn? What do we see? What did we hear? What did we learn? Uh, could be in terms of let's group some pain points together. Let's group some wish list things that people just said, oh man, I wish, I wish it did this. Or I use this other tool and it does these things. And why can't it just work like Amazon? Amazon filters are great. <laughs> I know how to search. I know how to use filters. That's a really, really powerful thing of like, what else do you use in your free life, in, in your real life that you like in your, or you're in your free time? Um, but all of that turns into, we need to synthesize that research. We need to take the knowledge out of our brains and get it down onto paper somehow. We typically use sticky notes and you get a room, get a handful of people in the same room, um, or you could do it yourself, to be honest, and just say, well, I heard all these things. You try to get one thought per sticky note and then you group them together into some themes. Um, we take those and we kind of put together like a bullet point list of this is what we heard, here are some problems, this is working really well, and here are some wish list items. Um, but then we synthesize that into documentation. So um, this is uh, like personas, just, you know, archetype users. We have, you know, if we're working with an application, typically it's going to be, you know, brand new user versus an expert. And experts do something this way. New people do it this way. Really trying to define who the, who the right user groups are. Um, same thing with content sites. If it's a, a public facing site, it's just like, this is what we know about your audience, either through analytics or research or a survey or what you told us, uh, but putting personas together and then tied with that is um, some form of a journey. What is the, what does their journey look like? What are the different touch points? What are they looking for at different phases of the journey? Um, we work with a very large hotel chain. And so what's the journey of planning a vacation? And that looks really different for a business user as it does for a, a family of four. Um, so really understanding the different needs and goals. We like goals. What are the goals of the user? Uh, trying to understand those as best we can and putting it into documents so that when we say, hey, we just wrapped up, you know, maybe it's uh, five sessions, maybe it's 30, maybe it's 100. That's an incredibly high end. Typically, it's like five to 12. Um, but we wrapped all this stuff up. We spent dozens and dozens of hours doing it or weeks but here's a document that I can kind of give to anybody that they get the highlights of what we just did. Cause nobody wants to hear hundreds of hours of research. They want to see a story and they want to understand this is what's happening today. The, these are the problems. This is working really well. And here's some recommendations from us of where to go next. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think you said a word that I really like, um, which is telling a story, which I think really helps 
Uh, I think people don't understand that sometimes if you're a really technical person, you can deliver a really technical yeah. work, uh, but you kind of need to do a little more than that. I don't want to maybe use hearts and minds, but you really need to like yeah. oh, get people to understand. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it, it's really impactful. Yeah. I think uh, if somebody asks me, you know, what I do for a living, a lot of it, a lot of times I answer and I, I tell stories and that's really what, what I do. Yeah. Um, we use research to inform the story, but you know, we're building characters through personas. We're building a storyline through journey maps or whatever diagram we're using to tell the process. Cause usually it's not a one step journey. It's, well, they do this and they do this and they do this. And you know, when you're booking a vacation, you start by kind of thinking about what you want it to be. Where are we going? When is it happening? It's like you're, there's a whole story going on and, and the website can inform them at that step. And then they're starting to make decisions. We know we're going to San Diego and we know it's going to be four days. And we know it's this date. And you start, then like you go to a different phase where you start comparing prices and comparing locations and all that stuff. But that's, that's a story you learn through research and you have to be able to tell. And uh, I find it really fun. I love, yeah. I love telling stories. Um, I'm, talking forever right now on some questions but um <laughs> yeah storytelling is incredibly important i think you know we we do research we synthesize it we figure out what it means or what it means to us and some ideas we have we kind of tell a story about that research and then we quickly transition into telling that same story through design so i love that we we identified that, you know, uh, planning a trip is incredibly important. And here's all the components to it. Dates, time, price, location. What can we do in that location? Um, and then you're like, okay, that, that sounds good. Ideally, you tell that story like as a, like a research presentation to whoever's in charge, your boss, your coworker, whoever. Um, and you identify some, some areas of opportunity, usually the pain points. This isn't – people really struggle – searching for locations or people are really having trouble doing blah. And that is the area to really focus on for design of taking, you know, looking at other, other websites that solve similar problems, um, looking at how Amazon does filters, whatever it is. And then you start designing and you're going to tell another story of, well, these are our people. This is the context. This is what they're trying to do. And here are some designs, you know, ideally wireframes or hand-drawn sketches even to say, this is how I think we can solve this problem. Very cool. Maybe we can now dig into, you know, you talked about telling the story through design and I'm curious how that might look in terms of next steps. Do you, you have all this data, do you jump into wireframes or is there something a step before that? Yeah, it's typically there's a step before. So we've identified um, problems and goals. They want to do this thing and here's an existing problem. Um, and we typically, I, I have no interest in redesigning the wheel. Uh, there's a lot of previous work out there that's pretty good. So we do, we do some, um, not extensive, but we typically a, a handful of hours or even a couple of days of just looking at other websites or other applications that solve similar goals. Um, typically you're not going to be so lucky to find a one-to-one -one that somebody does exactly the same thing in the exact same context for the exact same users, especially when we're designing uh, complicated applications. Maybe on content sites, you can get a little bit closer, but we just see what other people are doing. Um, I don't, I've been designing stuff since the late nineties. I don't think I've ever created anything unique. Like it's just, uh, you know, borrowing from other people and putting different disparate pieces together in a new way for the user I care about the most for that project. And um, that's fine. It works. It works pretty well. Yeah. So we do some research, see what other people are doing, um, and then that turns into typically some hand-drawn sketches. And we do that as a as a big group of people all in the same room. We have a you know we look at the everybody has a looking at the TV and we we pull up a site and we say hey this is our problem is uh, people can't find the location they care about uh, easily through search. And so here's some other websites that are doing it in similar ways or solving a similar problem. And then we have everybody draw just for a couple minutes, uh, as long as they understand the problem and the context, even if with a box and an arrow and black and white, I'm a terrible drawer. Mm -hmm. um, you can point to it and say, man, I think it'd be really cool if right here this said this information or this page showed these things or it was a map instead of a list. Uh, we can get a whole lot of really good ideas out of people's heads. And we include our clients on that as well. Um, 
and that turns into hand-drawn sketches, which eventually turns into a digital kind of cleaned up wireframe. Very cool. Okay. Um, since, uh, you know, Balsamic makes software specifically for wireframing, which yes. I know you know and have used. Um, I'm just curious though about how, how do you communicate your wireframes with stakeholders? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Um, what is your wireframing process? How do people respond to them? How do you talk about them in, you know, in your work? That is a, I'm taking a deep breath because it's a very hard question. Um, hard hitting, right? Here. We, we take a lot of care with this step because um, I think we spend every day of our life thinking about design. Our, our work life is 100% about design and this process like clicks. We're surrounded by people that this is all we do and all we think about during work. Uh, and our clients aren't. Our clients are thinking about my job is to manage this product or my job is to, you know, sell stuff. Uh, why is this black and white and ugly? And it's like, well, yeah, that's actually on purpose. Um, and so we do a ton of education around this point because it is such a weird thing that designers do and we don't really think twice about it. Um, so our, our process is we get, you know, wireframes put in place. And if that's, uh, you know, whatever tool we're using, and honestly, sometimes we start hand drawn, but then we really lean on all of that synthesis work that we already did out of research. So this is the person, you know, when I'm, if I was presenting a wireframe to you right now, I don't want to be presenting to Billy Carlson. I want you to pretend that you're the persona that we care about for the project. Uh, I want you to think that you're somebody processing claims, sitting in a service center, uh, and that you need to do so many today or else you're not getting that end of your bonus. And is yeah. I need to help you. I need to build that story for you so that when you finally do see a design, you say, ah, oh, okay, I get it. I understand. Yeah. Um, and I don't want your personal opinion. I kind of want your personal opinion based on the persona we created for you and the context we set up for you and then the screen that you're finally looking at to say oh yeah it's a list view i totally get a list view um makes sense because the tasks that i would be doing if i was that person are x y and c yeah. um so a lot of a lot of what we do is just education and a lot of it's relying on some level of research and synthesis to explain who we are what we're doing what our tasks are and then a lot of education around why is this black and white and maybe a little bit of color for like links uh, to say that it's it's kind of ugly on purpose. It's really to highlight the page, like the information hierarchy, the page priority, the navigation. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to remove all color so we don't have people saying, well, I hate orange. It's like, mm, that's, that's like, we're not there yet. We, that's like, you know, a couple weeks away still. Um, we're really trying to figure out, like, can you find that big button that says next? Can you figure out how to move from this page to the next page? And that's what wireframes are really, really good at, really focusing on um, what's the most important thing on the page purely based off like information hierarchy. That's awesome. Totally agree. That's why we think it's so important. A little plug. Yeah. Super we, true. Like every designer is not lying when they think it's a, it's a very important part of making something. Yeah. It's um, the, so we do, we do a lot. We do for, uh, early research, first person research, we synthesize all the research. We design a lot of things. We do more research after we design things just to make sure that changes we're suggesting are going to work and be well received. Um, we do, you know, visual design, some front end code, but the great, great, great majority of every single project is wireframes. We spend more time here than, than on anything else because it is, um, it's critically important. We want to get it right. We want to get it right early. Changing a wireframe is so much faster and cheaper than changing visual design, an order of magnitude cheaper than changing code, uh, especially front end code. And then if, if you know, things get into production and you still have to change them, you're just, you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time that we probably don't have as consultants. Yeah. Um, so wireframes are a great place to iterate, you know, get an idea out. You can do it pretty quickly, get it in front of people, say, Hey, we're thinking about doing this for the dashboard. What do you think? And get some feedback and really quickly iterate on it. Yeah, I think that's the biggest uh, communication, difficult uh, thing to communicate is how important it is down the road. Um, let me re-say that in a better way, but 
trying to communicate how important it is to do wireframes at this stage and really focus on them, not just do like a sketch or two and then dive in because you're going to save so much money yeah. and time and frustration. And, um, and the thing is when you're working on a product, time and money are really important, but frustration also can increase the longer, uh, longer it takes to finish something and the more changes that have to be made. So yes, for, sake for, of your sure. team, for the sake of your team, <laughs> yeah, I think we spend some time on it. Yeah, um, so yeah. What? Uh, who loves you know V eighteen of a document? It's just like ah, <laughs> uh, I just don't even care anymore. I just want to be done. <laughs> and like uh, the whole so point of a wireframe is that they're quickly editable. You can you know save a version, but you can kind of throw it out, and you're not wasting like weeks and weeks of work. Um, get an idea, sketch it up, put it into a wireframe, test it, iterate, and you know. Ideally, you get, you get an approval, and approvals mean something. Uh, so you're not revising every decision you make, you know, a week after you make it. That's great. So right now we've covered how to start a project, how to do the research, how to ideate with your client or with a team and collaborate on that, and then jump into wireframes. So my next question is, I guess it's still teetering on wireframes to like the high fidelity designs, but um, do you spend time making the wireframes more polished? Like, are you thinking of things in terms of like UI design rules, uh, you know, basic principles of UI design in your wireframes? Yeah, we, we try to, uh, we will use, um, and I'm not going to lie. I am, uh, I haven't gotten my hands dirty on a wireframe and <laughs> Longer than I would like to admit. I, I, <laughs> I'm a designer by trade, but now I'm a more of a, You're business, a business owner, business dude. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I don't get to design. But uh, the designers here that do get to make wireframes, which I love, is uh, they're they're all using libraries of some sort. So we try to make, even though it's kind of ugly, we do try to get you know sizing right we we have different sizes for headers than body copy we have different colors for links versus body copy um buttons i, I do a couple talks like this every once in a while i could talk about buttons for a really long time i, I really really care about buttons um, so do i i think they're yeah. really important to get right yeah i like uh generally especially for an application a big uh, smashable target that you know it's the only bright blue thing on a page yeah. Um, so when I'm trying to get through a multi-step process, my eyeball is just looking for the big blue thing. I don't really care what the words say as long as I know that that means, you know, continue down this path to completion. Yeah. Uh, so our wireframes will have a big blue button and maybe a secondary button and every once in a while like a, a tertiary link and I, I care very deeply about all of this. <laughs> um, so know, do I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reserve in our wireframes, you really get maybe four colors outside of black and white and gray. Um, we, we reserve color, uh, status colors, typically green, yellow, or orange and red. Um, but the only time you'll ever see those specific colors are for a status. Things are good, things are bad, or hey, you might want to check this one out. Um, along with the blue of just, you know, this is clickable, you can move forward. Once that gets to visual design, maybe those, change, those colors tweak a little bit, but we're still gonna have status those three status colors and a, a primary color which means like move forward in the process but we try to mimic that in the wireframes having yes. said that the wireframes are not like visually designed we stay with black and white and gray in those colors um sizing does matter we try to get the type sizes pretty close to what we're working on for visual design but um otherwise you know they look nice they look clean i uh i had a client asked me if I had OCD the first time I met her and uh because I do like things that line up really nicely um the huge like part my, of design yeah my uh my door behind me um <laughs> but uh yeah wireframe should be it should be clean they shouldn't look sloppy um but it's you know just enough to get the point across they don't need to look perfect yeah I always feel like there's there could even be if you have the time, you can do levels of wireframe. Like the first levels are the ideation, and then the further down, you have refined wireframes, yeah. so that the visual design phase is much shorter, and you know it's it's much easier to move clean uh, boxes in there, cl clean boxes and text around, and yes. then to update. Um, 
Okay, so great answers so far. Thank you. Thank you. I expect nothing less. Um, I think my next question, and I, I get this a lot from, I guess, people that are like, you know, you that are, I'm not, I don't draw, you know, those types of things. Like, I don't feel like I'm creative. I can't do visual design. How mm -hmm. do you approach the visual design phase then when it has to get to high fidelity? Yeah, that's, uh, it's hard for me. And I, my honest answer is I would avoid it as, as much as humanly possible for myself. Um, it, it is, a, so it's kind of similar, but a question I get a lot when I, when I speak to people is how do your visual designers and your UX designers work together? And I think it's a really interesting question to me because every time I hear it, I kind of like think real hard about it. And we, we don't wrestle with it as much as other people do, I don't think. Mm -hmm. because we include both of them throughout the duration of the project. Uh, we have visual designers engaged really early and they're think they're part of the project. They're, you know, consuming the research. Maybe they are part of the research a little bit here and there, but you know, maybe 10%. Um, but we don't, ex so user, user experience designers doing research, synthesizing the research and creating wireframes. And then a visual designer is thinking in terms of uh, consuming the existing brand, extending it to an application or a website, and they really think in color and you know visual aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, we don't expect the visual designer to take a wireframe and just turn a gray box into a green box and say, "Hey, it's it looks really nice now." Um, we do expect a little bit of a challenge or um, healthy tension between like, hey, this is kind of how, this is the wireframe, how it was laid out, but I think it should look like this. And we have uh, discussions throughout of how do, okay. I think yeah. just visually it's gonna work better like this, or what if we used a bigger type, whatever here, or we moved this box around. Um, I think there's a lot of interpretation, a lot of gray area between the handoff of a wireframe to the final visual design. I really don't want it to be that they're just taking it and like painting a cake. I yeah. want them to really think hard about visually, I think it's going to work best this way without, you know, greatly changing the intent of the page. That's great. Yeah. I think that's a great lesson to learn is you may have polished wireframes, but it is also just another jumping off point to get to the polished visual design. So. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think uh, maybe a better answer to your question, now that I've had a second to think about it is, uh, even with zero design skills, like visual design skills, I, you can surely get the intent of what you want across in your designs. So what is, so if you, if you put a page together, you take it, you know, take a couple minutes off, come back to it or a day and ask yourself like, what's the biggest thing on the page? If I, if I'm just looking at this and kind of scanning it, where's my eye stick? And is that where I want my eye to stick? Do I want my eye to stay on the phone number because that's the biggest thing in the left, the left hand side of the page. Um, maybe if you want the phone, if, if it's contact page or you want somebody to know the phone number, but if, if that wasn't your intent of the design, that's a really good question to ask yourself of where's my eye sticking and is that where I want the user's eye to stick? Um, and you can do that in black and white and gray and just changing the size of boxes or spacing. You don't have to be a visual designer to, yeah. to design something. I can't design anything in terms of color but I can surely get the point across of what's the most important thing on this page, what should be big, where should the eyeballs stop. And there's a lot of tips and tricks you can use, um, yeah. sizing, color, all that good stuff. That's great, yeah. One of the things I talk a lot about too is helping non-designers or people new uh, to understand the importance of scannability, which goes to just what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, being able to just glance at a page and call out you know, three primary things those are what people are going to focus on pretty, pretty quickly. So that should be important. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that stuff's uh, scannability, the all the gestalt principles, or however yeah. you pronounce that in the proper language. That was correct. <laughs> I think so, um, that's it's. You look at it, and I think you do. Like, yeah, obviously, that's closure. I, I yeah. can make a circle, even though it's only a C. Um, but that really plays to your advantage as somebody creating a wireframe of grouping like information, lots of spacing, intelligent spacing, intelligent use of size, 
a lot of really good stuff in, in learning just the way our brains work and applying it to a wireframe is, is really fun stuff. That's awesome. Great. Uh, so I think we covered a lot here. I kind of want to mini pivot and talk about content because yeah. we had a, a little brief conversation before we got uh, recording, but I think you made a really good insight, but content sites versus applications, how does content play a part? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that it's, that it's a great laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Keep that in. Uh, it's so important. Um, in, so an application where you're just, you're trying to make it through a process because your job says get through this process, you know, as quickly, as efficiently as possible. The most important thing is that big blue smashable target of just like, yeah, I want to go to the next step, uh, fill in this information, next step, fill in this information, next step, and I'm done. Where content is really secondary to, you know, it's information, it's data, it's, you know, maybe a call to action, like complete this form. Um, but there's not a lot of content outside of what's absolutely necessary. You know, you're, even, you're hiding advanced search because not everybody's going to use it, so you collapse it. So you're really hiding information versus designing a, you know, a content site um, where it's the exact opposite, where people are looking to consume information and they want to read articles or they want to find poetry or they want to uh, book a hotel, which is kind of a mix of a little bit of content and a little bit of application because there's a process, but a lot of it is just consuming information in the right order. And writing content is really, really important. Um, I'm not, I'm not a content writer. I probably caught a couple grammar errors and just me speaking. So uh, <laughs> let alone me writing, but um, uh, I think it's, it's critical to know what you want people to be able to do and how to properly message it. Um, I don't think, you know, kind of tying it into a wireframe, which is my world, it doesn't have to be perfect content, but it, I tr tr do my very, very best with the skills I have inside of, inside of me to get the purpose across of what I want. So headline messages, really important. Um, body copy, I, I do my best to try to keep it, even if I'm using warm ipsum or some fake -like language, bacon ipsum or whatever, trying to keep it to the right length of content. So is this a sentence or is it a paragraph? Is it one paragraph or five paragraphs? Um, and try to keep that uh, in the wireframe as much as possible. Try to keep it real, even if it's not the final copy. You're like, in this paragraph, I think we should talk about these data points because this is important. And I get that in the wireframe. But um, content is, is critically important. We will test content specifically, uh, making sure people can find what they're looking for, making sure that the copy is the right copy to explain a process or just get people the information that they need. That's awesome. Okay, I have two more questions. Um, so my next one is, we and you did touch on this a little bit, is feedback. Um, yeah. How do you work on getting feedback throughout the process? So you talked about testing content. I know you test wireframes. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe just talk a little bit about content, um, not content, uh, getting feedback. Uh, feed, <laughs> feedback is like a- Feedback. The double. Double-edged sword. Uh, it's some of the greatest stuff in the world to kind of validate, you know, we have a new idea. Let's get some feedback and see if it works. And sometimes you're kind of just done with feedback if it's not the right kind or not from the right people. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think that we're kind of in charge of making sure we get the right feedback because at the end of the day, it's uh, critically important. I, nobody at FuzzMath thinks our opinions are right we always validate it with, with the right people, with the end user. Um, so it's really similar if we're watching somebody use existing software early on of, you know, hey, just use this thing, kind of speak out loud uh, while you're doing it. We try to do the exact same thing with our wireframes in a perfect world with our wireframes, with visual design and with front end code. Yeah. Rarely that happens. Um, it's true. But it, <laughs> yeah, it's like I mean, research. Uh, we don't have budget for that. Um, we we do really similar tasks or really similar research. So we try to take our wireframes, um, give people a handful of tasks to do it uh, or to get through using the wireframes and say, hey, can you complete this task, start on this page and talk aloud as you go? And they will 
fingers crossed, they will be able to do it better than they did it with the previous tool. But, um, you know, 99 times out of 100, we're going to catch a couple things here and there of, yeah, they really got stuck and we, we buried this thing a little too deep or, um, you know, the headline didn't really capture the, the content of the page properly. So they skipped over this page entirely and we need to rework some words here and there. But um, so feedback from users through research is, is ideal. Feedback from our clients, our, our clients, no matter how hard we try, they understand their business a little bit better than us. Um, yeah. So just presenting wireframes and saying, you know, it could be something as quick as, hey, if you have five minutes, I just, this idea I want to show you and kind of walk them through really quick. Or um, what we do on, you know, on projects more or less is we have a dedicated hour, hour and a half every single week. And we are getting feedback from our clients. Um, they could be users or sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're completely removed, but they know the business well enough that as long as we build that story correctly, you're this person doing this thing, you know, put their hat on, take yours off and check out this, this process or this wireframe or this visual design, uh, getting feedback is super important. Um, a lot of tools have um, like, we can send a, a link out to them with wireframes or comps. They can add comments, you know, click on something and say, this link doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, really we're trying to pull as much feedback as humanly possible out yeah. of people, especially early on in the process with wireframes. That's really cool. I'm going to pause here and just note that I'm going to add that you could do that with balsamic. So. Yeah, I didn't know. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, I'm just like, ooh, I'm going to overlay that. So um, we could do a little pause here. I think everything has gone perfectly well. Um, Sweet. My last question is about design being released and what's next, but every yeah. time I ask it, I don't know. Do you think that's an important thing to add? Um, I, yeah, if we're talking, if the audience is like new people, new, DMs, yeah. I think it's, it, yeah, like your job's not done. <laughs> like yeah, and like, so I've been asked that a few times in class and I thought that was like, oh yeah, you don't realize that you own, you own the little baby now. You got to help it grow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah. I'm going to go back and um, I'm going to go back in the interviewee mode and... Cool. Okay. All right, so my last question is, um, I feel like I didn't comment on how well that... No, I think I did. Okay, start over again. I was going to say your last thing was great. So I was like, oh, great. That's a great insight. Even though it really was, that seems sarcastic. It was. All right. Okay. So, so you're kind of, and now that we've talked through it in this design process, you're done. So, uh, well, I guess it hasn't gone to, to code yet, but we can maybe skip that part. We're not going to dig deep into how to code a website or product or application, but let's talk about what happens once this is released. So you've worked to do all the research, you know, the collaboration, the ideation, the, the design, and now it's out in the wild. What happens next? Yeah, that, uh, it's a really interesting question. And I think it's, um, I have a couple different points of view, but the, the short version is the work is not done. We, it's just the beginning of a new phase. Um, so what, what we see is, you know, we're external party, we're, we're, uh, we're consultants. So we don't get to own any project that we design ever. Um, some ways it's nice and some ways it isn't, but you know, we, we worked hard for probably a couple months on this thing and we have this really nice package at, at minimum visual design, typically some front end code. And we, we hand it off to our clients kind of goes into a black hole, but at some point it becomes real. And then, you know, it's, it's probably not us anymore, but it's probably their internal team that the process basically starts over again, that now we have a new thing. And something's going to change if it's external competition adds a new feature and oh we have to catch up or if it's the market kind of shifts, but whatever we designed is kind of a, it, it's static in terms of its code, but it should be a living thing that it should change. And the, the reasons for change should be more testing and more user research and figuring out, all right, we got this thing. It works so much better than what we had. Let's not wait three more years until it's terrible. Let's make some small incremental changes over time because that's a whole lot easier than it is to just kind of let it sit there and fester and, and get real, real fast. That's so interesting. That's, it's a, something that I, I, apparently I forgot, but yeah, like just because you redesign it doesn't mean that more doesn't need to happen or continue to happen. Yeah. That's how it got old in the first place. Yeah. Think and about it, that way. And I, we're, I think we're pretty good at what we do, but there's always, you know, there's always something more we want to do. I've never left a project thinking like, Oh man, that thing is a hundred percent perfect. 
Um, there's always a wish list and, you know, we didn't have time, we didn't have budget or just there wasn't an appetite or, you know, people just didn't think it was a good idea, which probably right a lot of times, but there's always this list of stuff. And I think it's just learning of, all right, release this thing. Let's track some metrics. Let's, you know, uh, satisfaction scores, usage, whatever the right metrics are. Let's, let's take a look at those things and let's check in every, you know, every three months, every six weeks, whatever it is that makes sense for, for the organization. But I think saying that we're done is incorrect. It's that this phase is done and now we have this new thing out in the wild. If it's really, really small or really, really huge, we still need to kind of take care to make sure it's, it's the best thing it can be. That's it. That's it. Great. I love that. Uh, well, I think that wraps up my questions. I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. Um, no, I was, I'm trying to think of a joke about gray hoodies and I'm failing. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, that wraps it up. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Ben. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it was great insights. Thank you. I had a blast. This is great. Me too. I'll talk to you later, man. Sweet. Thank you. See ya. Bye.